Hello and welcome to episode 37 of The Garden Log with me, Ben Dark. I am a gardener and I am also a podcaster. And this podcast is a way for me to share what I've been up to in my garden and hopefully give some people some ideas about what they might want to do. Maybe give them a warning about what they might not want to do. And also recommend some of the garden media that I have been consuming over the past seven days. This week I begin things underneath the old oak trees on a sunny south-facing bank where I'm dealing with some short-lived perennials. I move into some very shady woodland to deal with some weeds. We go back to the hay meadow to start scalping things, to start causing a bit of ruckus and destruction. And we peer briefly into the life of a great Victorian gardener, who no doubt will make all of us, or perhaps just me, feel very inadequate and lazy indeed. That's all to come, so no point hanging around on introductions any longer. Let's get on with the week in gardening. Hello and welcome to the week in gardening. This week started with an acorn falling upon my head, which as anyone who knows the story of Chicken Licken, or Chicken Little if you are in America, or something else, something Dutch sounding if you're in Holland or Danish if you're in Denmark, it's a, it's a very common old fairy tale. Anyway, the acorn falls upon the head of this chicken who interprets this as the sky falling and the end of the world. I am not a chicken, I have a significantly larger brain, and I interpret it as the sign of encroaching autumn. It's sneaking up on us all with its crispy orange fingers. Anyway, what was I doing under that oak tree? I was fiddling about. I was fiddling about with old forget-me-nots. The forget-me-nots that had bloomed magnificently earlier in the season and then had set their seeds diligently, like good little reproductive members of the plant community, and then their work done had settled down to turn grey, like old dishcloths. That very unappealing sort of grey, not the nice dignified grey of a posh house circa 2015, or a silvery grey of a very elegant plant, the silvery grey maybe of the, the leaf lining on a runner Jack Frost, but the tarnished and dirty grey of a of a pencil case rubber, a rubber kept rather too close to all of the 2B pencils and their associated trimmings. Not a nice grey, a grey to get rid of. The wonderful thing about forget-me-nots is that if they like their situation and they like their garden, then they will seed themselves so freely that you can almost draw with them. You can say, right, I will create a line and an arc of weeded ground and that shall be brown and the rest of the garden will be blue come spring. I think Myotosis sylvatica, the common wood forget-me-not, is technically a short-lived perennial, but I always find it's best to treat it as a biennial. So let the seeds set and then let it go for a one year, maybe two years after that, and then pull the whole thing out because it's going to start looking really, really ropey. And that was the kind of thing I did on Monday. I tidied up that whole oak understory area. It's a very sunny oak understory because these oaks are on a south-facing hillside, a very steep hillside. So you get all sorts of sun streaming in there in the afternoons, particularly in the summer. And then earlier in the year, in the spring, then the the leaves aren't on the oak trees. So there's ground reaching light for things like forget-me-nots. So it's quite actually quite a good area to garden in. There's roses under there and there are... All sorts of other little things, funny little shrubs, like the the beauty berry, the calicarpa, that thing with the bright purple berries. And it was a day of, as I said, encroaching autumn, and I was working with forget-me-nots, 
that ever so evocative name, which should have prompted melancholy and reflective thoughts in me, but didn't. I don't know what I thought about. I couldn't possibly tell you. Sometimes it's nice in gardening not to think about anything, just to let the mind wander. And wander it did. It also wandered home and then wandered back again on Tuesday when I did some more weeding. This is very, very unlike me to do two actually necessary horticultural tasks in a row. I did some weeding, and it's weeding in another area of the garden, in the middle of some very big borders. These borders have established things growing in them. They have canopies and sub-canopies and sub-sub-canopies. But still, at ground level, there are weeds. And the weed I was taking out was Enchanter's Nightshade. And I felt a bit sorry for it, because gosh, if you are growing in that darker place, then just get on with it. But um, that's not the, not the way of my job, not the way of my job description. I get the weeds out. And so I went in there and pulled the thing out. Anyone who's dealt with Enchanter's Nightshade will know that it's a charming little thing, despite the common name, which I think is a bit overblown. Enchanter's Nightshade sounds very Dungeons and Dragons. It sounds like a, well, for, for, such a, for such an innocuous little thing. It's like if I named my small Honda Jazz Firewind. It doesn't seem right somehow. I think the name is supposed to come from, from Circe, that dread goddess from the Odyssey, because she, she mixes up a potion, doesn't she? She mixes up a, a cheese and wine soup and puts baneful herbs into it to turn the men into pigs. And I assume that, that this is one of the baneful herbs. I think it's named by Linnaeus, so I think at that stage, in 1753, he was just grabbing anything he could from anywhere. He looked at the wall and said, well, I'll, I'll name that uh, clock plant, uh, minute hand, ear. And he looked into his book of Greek myths and said, gosh, we better have a, a genus Circea, and we, we better have a, a Tagetes, and we better have a, all of those names that are from... from Greek myth. Tajit has actually, that kind of makes sense. But um, anyway, so it's, it's, an, it's an innocuous little weed and it has these most wonderful white roots, really satisfying thick white spaghetti roots, like the roots you find on ground elder and bindweed. So it's kind of a safe, a safe alternative for people looking for a fix of really satisfying weeding amongst the, the white roots. You can do that without any actual danger of death, destruction and collapse if you leave any of the roots out. I read somewhere that a trick to, to this is to cover the area that is infected with the stuff in leaf mould and just encourage the plant to root into the leaf mould. Then you can pull the thing out as easily as if you were plucking the seeds from a dandelion clock or maybe as if you were plucking a fairy from a bed of roses. The only thing to watch out for is if you have a lot of them growing alongside the, the common violet, Viola riviniana, which grows in similar conditions and in this garden grows exactly alongside the Enchanter's Nightshade. And were you to give instructions to weed out all of the Enchanter's Nightshade to some sort of overzealous assistant or temporary worker, then maybe they might weed out all of the viola as well. And then you would have no one to blame but yourself. So that was Tuesday, a day of dealing with Circea Lutiana, the Enchanter's Nightshade. On Wednesday, I had to rectify one of my many, many mistakes. This one, a mistake of omission rather than of malice. Earlier in the year, I talked about a battle I'd been having with the lilies. And as everyone knows, a battle is just a small component of a larger thing called a war. And I had taken such pride in the victories in these battles I had gone on my parades and taken my medals that I'd forgotten that we were still fighting. I took my eyes from the lilies. I let the beetles go back to business. 
the plants had finished flowering and I made that classic mistake of focusing on other things, just seeing them as another patch of green. And then when I went back to the lilies, those wonderful tall spires were half munched down by the grubs of the lily beetle. And lily beetle grubs, as I described earlier, are horrible things. They are fat little maggots that cover themselves in this horrible green-black excretia. And now I know from seeing this major infestation that what they do is the, the adult lily beetle lays normally three eggs, tiny, tiny little eggs. They look almost like iron filings, tiny little eggs at the end of one of those pointed lily leaves. And then the lily beetle grubs start eating and they grow as they eat and they eat down the leaf, all of them in parallel like fat slimy scale electrics cars going down and down and getting bigger and bigger as they go until they reach the stem as vast semi-pupating things ready to spawn the next generation of bright red beetles. So I spent a satisfying few hours going around to all of the lilies and fighting them by fighting, well I won't go into that. Something interesting to report about that is that not all lily plants seem equally tasty. Some plants have got a real infestation, others mere feet away are relatively or completely untouched. And I don't know if this is because the lily beetle is a lazy, flightless thing, or if some genuinely are unpalatable to these dangerous insects. Perhaps someone could enlighten me. Perhaps there is a, a lily expert out there shouting now at their podcast device saying, you fool, how could you not know that? I don't know. If you are, then you can email me at thegardenlogpodcast at gmail.com. That was Wednesday. There were some other bits and pieces of horticultural work, but they were so quotidian that I won't bore you with them. Most of them involved hose pipes and watering cans. On Thursday, I went back to the meadow, the unfinished crime, and finally finished raking up all of that sweet-smelling meadow grass. It is amazingly sweet. I know it's a cliché from reading alpine romances, as I do so often, that the sweet smell of the hay, but it really does smell sweet. There's nothing else to it. It's just a, a very soft, lovely sweetness. It's as if someone had taken a cannon and then filled it full of icing sugar and blasted it and then you'd walked through the, the subsequent haze maybe 20 minutes or so later. That's the sort of sweetness. The hay we raked up and dumped in vast, vast piles. We have no animals to feed with it. So what we'll do is we will turn it a few times during the year and let it rot down and rot down and then we will use it as compost. After that we went over the field with the ride-on mower, cutting it really, really short. And I'm talking scalping short. I'm talking chunks of earth being grazed by those whirling blades. The reason is to damage the ground a little bit, basically. We are taking away the fertility of the soil by carting off all of the spent grass. And then we're also going to sow yellow rattle which is that semi-parasitic plant that is supposed to weaken the grass, to tap into their root energy like a vampire, and so improve the, the biodiversity of the meadow. Were it a normal wet English summer, I'd be sowing the yellow rattle now, but I think I'll wait until the clouds come, the sky darkens, and then I will chuck some seed about and hope that it takes off. And I'm afraid that is it for Meadows this week, Meadow fans. I'm just looking at my notes and wondering what on earth I did on Friday. There's nothing here, it is all blank. And now I remember that I didn't go to work on Friday. I went to the Norfolk Broads, Norwich and Southwold. It was gorgeous. Lots of sunshine, lots of Norman Round Tower churches. A bit of garden visiting, but who wants to listen to that? on a gardening podcast. I saw a, a lovely National Trust place, one of the ones that isn't a jewel in the crown of the National Trust. 
one of the everyday National Trust gardens, which I find quite interesting because there you don't get that full on, we're going to throw 15 staff members and all of this money at the borders. You get the impression of a big charity trying its best to stretch limited resources over the garden. So bits of it were very scrappy and untended. Bits of it were obviously specimen or special planting areas and they decided to let the rest go to rack and ruin. And I quite like that because these big country houses, they always go through periods of boom and bust. Someone has married an heiress and suddenly there's money to, to plant. Oh no, the, the eldest son has gambled the family fortune. Time to sack all the gardeners. So there would have been periods where they, they, the gardens lay almost fallow. And this was, this was coming towards that area in spaces. I liked it a lot. So that was it. A slightly truncated week in gardening this week. Anyone who feels short changed, uh, they can write to me, I guess. Now, I think it's probably time that we went to see if we have any recommendations this week. This week I have been visiting a website and that website is thomasruddy.co.uk and I should say that Thomas Ruddy is not a friend of mine, it is not a nepotistic plug for anyone I know. In fact Thomas Ruddy is dead. He died over a hundred years ago in 1912 after having spent his life as a late Victorian head gardener. It should be clear then that it is not he who writes this blog at thomasruddy.co.uk but an amanuensis, a member of his family, is communicating with the deceased through the medium of an old diary. And this old diary is fantastic. It records the day-to-day -day life of a head gardener, but also his family life, how he goes to get photos of the children taken, how he goes on trips to various churches across Wales to see ancient crosses, and most interesting for me, as I've been visiting other gardens, how he goes on tour to see the gardens of other gardeners, both in the UK and abroad. And he has wonderful little succinct descriptions of things, like the gardens are very nice but contained nothing in particular. I think that were he alive today, he would have almost certainly had a gardening podcast. And it would almost certainly have been equally as good as this one. Though probably neater, because he was a Victorian, so he gardened neatly. I should say that this was no tin pot garden. He was gardening at a place called Parley, which was grand enough to have Queen Victoria herself pay a five-day visit in 1889. And saying the name of that deceased monarch seems to have called down the thunder and lightning. Apologies if you can now hear rain drumming on the roof and the occasional peal of thunder. As if on cue. I don't know if that was picked up or not. Anyway, it started raining. Thank goodness for that. Let's hope the gardens are appreciating it. If you don't like gardening... You can read this just for the social history. I'm a big fan of the incongruous juxtaposition of gardening and other things. Like when I was reading the, the Derek Jarman diaries and he was talking about uh, weeding as the sunset behind the nuclear power station. I love the, the wider world peering in to our domestic and quaint world of gardening. And I, I love this, these, these lines that he writes in January of 1885. The last year has been a warm and fruitful one. Every crop did well in the garden. Our government have sent troops to the Nile to get General Gordon out of Khartoum. I've probably only read 5% of the entries on this wonderful website, which again to recap is thomasruddy.co.uk and I am so grateful to the people who are uploading this magnificent journal 
They upload pictures from the journal, clippings that he's pasted into it, and I hope they continue to do so for a very long time. Maybe someday someone will be using this podcast in a similar manner to recreate the life of a early 21st century gardener and podcaster. My other recommendation is The Great Dixter Book of Meadows. I haven't read it, but my incredibly able and talented assistant slash colleague has, and he has been guiding the entire meadow process using the, the Great Dixter book as a sort of Bible. And so far it's served us fairly well. So thank you very much to that book. If you have not learned enough about managing your hay and wildflower meadow from these podcasts, then I think you could do worse than finding a copy of that tome. Anyway, that's enough recommendations for one week. I hope you enjoyed the episode. We are now coming to that teetering end of the heatwave. I think that things are going to crack. Surely they must. You can only microwave an egg so long before it explodes, and I'm feeling pretty well cooked. So maybe in future weeks we will have a more soggy and wet and chilled approach to the the podcast and approach to the gardening tasks. Let's hope so. A reminder that you can, if you wish, leave me a review on iTunes or a rating. It doesn't have to be on iTunes. It can be anywhere. It could be on the wall of your neighbor's house. And you can also email me at thegardenlogpodcast at gmail.com. If I get a very good email, I will certainly read it out. But you don't have to contribute to the broadcast at all. You can just say hello. If you want to see some pictures of what I've been up to, I'm on Instagram at Gardener Dark. And if you would like to approach me in person, I am normally somewhere on the edge of the Chilterns or in South East London. Just find the guy with the dirty fingers. Until next week, I hope you stay cool. I hope you read the diary of Thomas Ruddy. I hope you look at your lilies and inspect them for corpulent beetle grubs. And I hope you enjoy all of your activities, horticultural or otherwise. Thank you and goodbye.